Son of Goya. One, my father paints walls. My father paints walls because the daylight is malignant and his eyesight is benign, because dead trees mock him, because death's weather courts him, because time's wife spits through cracks. Two, he has lost all worldly goods, all physical money. Where are the friends to comfort his idleness or cure his fear? The accumulations of humanness choke his breathing, yield no rest. All time is his. He paints his walls. Three, the king has commanded his demise, vowed to make my father wear an axe, to scissor his eyes, to set fire to his skin, all to scratch envy's initials on his heart with a pebble and a rag. Four, because his nails are too short, his strength too weak, his breath too harried, his bones too frail, his heart unsure to take his hands and paint their face. He paints his walls. My father paints walls. Five, on the walls are monsters, cities, men, gods, murderers, pilgrims, a witch, a spy, two rifles, a woman, a dog in the sand. These I see, these he lives. Poor father, housed in a private darkness, alone on another earth. Six, I am not against the darkness. I can learn to live with restraint. But nothing moves here in the ink, and nothing speaks. Nothing speaks in terror of its voice. Nothing but the oily voice of father. Animate in the darkness, where all things hold their breath. Seven. Last week, I returned home and entered the house of a deaf man, disenfranchised of patrons beyond the vile hearing of the world. I entered the house of Goya, the painter, self-abandoned, deaf to light. I entered the house and saw Goya sitting in misery, swallowed by darkness. Magritte, one, introduction to Magritte. I pick Magritte up from the bottom of a star. He is desolate with lavender. Who is it, he moans, touching my wrist with his wing. I help him to his feet, careful of his cedar leg. Behind his grimace, he is smiling like a man drowning in warm water. Two, first experience, dawn. We climb through a busted window. Magritte cuts his arm. Blood drops out like rusty pennies. A mermaid standing on wet gravel waves to us. He doffs his bowler. The black paraffin that fills his head spills out. This always happens. What's in your palm, he asks. She opens it. It's a baby oyster covered in cobweb. Three, second experience, mid-morning. The days is gray as a century of salmon eggs. One sun-packed building catches my attention. No, he says, under this arch. We cobble our way through old street streets, past vegetable merchants, occasional hunchbacks, daughters yet to be consecrated. Arriving at the pier, I see a sailboat in dead wind. That is pathos, Magritte says, pointing to a barnacle. Four, the woman. She folds and unfolds her kerchief, folding her eyes in her lap. Her fingers are long and drawn and thin, like hollow reeds or scabbards. She is all meekness, all pastel. We see her at the scaffold, darkening in the air, where the clouds are heaving like minstrels, and the hawks watch as they fly. Her majesty derives from open clouds, yet she derives from twilight. We salute her in tandem and gasp as her voice rises and rises into our eyes. Five, Toledo. That evening, stepping over lengthening shadows, we are in Toledo, where the moon appears as the white bone of a rose, where four clouds create the horizon where four sounds echo through the streets. At the curtain of a city, we come across a thin strand of finger belonging to El Greco. Give that to the woman, says Magritte. 
She has more need of the digit than we. Six, bedtime narrative. And on that day, the creator said to speech, What makes your skin flat like the river? I shall give you wounds to perform in your flesh, so that you may never be plain to me. And he was pleased with the lesion, which he called silence, and he touched his lips to the sky. That place today is forbidden to birds. 7. Waking. Now the tendon of God is stretched to plain view. A million onions have been carried to the mirror. Long birds fly in broken formation. All is amethyst and milk. Without warning, the white sword crashes down on orthodoxy. The sky splits open like hell's abortion. A Saracen sun advances on Magritte. The Grave of Rambeau. I visited the grave of Rambeau. It was pale blue like the blood of a baby penguin. Upon its headstones were designs, beautiful and mysterious, like the brain waves of deer. I touched the grave and found it redemptive, like the law forbidding adultery. I thought I was alone, but I was in the midst of a vast crowd, hissing like poisonous snakes on fire. I had imagined the grave of Rambeau standing out from its field like a single candle in a cake. The grave itself was small, attic, quiet as a king at the end of his reign. Around the grave, the grass was burned, gray and stiff, like the lips of lovers who no longer kiss. I sat by the grave and felt at home, like bigotry in the hearts of men of God. Then darkness settled over the grave, sentimentally, like a kitten on the neck of a man. I left the grave and returned to Marseille, aligned like a knife in Adam's apple. The hotel where Sanin hanged himself. Epigraph. To set forth in the place of easy beauty of death another kind of beauty. Vladimir Mayakovsky. I walk by the hotel where Sanin hanged himself. They remodeled it so foreigners wouldn't have access to his despair. He first tried slashing his wrists. That didn't work. Blood flew everywhere. Counters, chairs, sheets. He sopped it up with his hands. Wrote eight red lines on the walls. Then he smashed the mirrors. This was in 1925. He was 30 years old. Dawn in St. Petersburg looks a lot like midnight. It's four years later. Mayakovsky has been writing poems to counter his sins, to make his sins end uninteresting. Of course, he fails. Then he looks square at the world and decides it's not for him either. Leaves a note. Against the everyday has crashed of love my boat. Pulls a pistol, shoots himself. The bullet Ricochet is off the ceiling and breaks his heart. When writers look in mirrors, they stare at ghosts. Vion, stop following me around. Vion, you've got to stop following me around. It's enough already. I'm not going to tell you where I've hidden the loot. Touche pas au Grisby. Vion, get the hell out of here. My work is dangerous, and you're an orphan. Go back to the reformatory and paint with oil. Vion, I'm not going to tell you again. Shoo, vamoose, take a hike, walk away. If I see you here again, I'll beat you like a dead horse. <laughs>